It's been some time since we covered someone who's as much a crowd pleaser as the lead in today's various subjects. Truth be told though, we've been saving this one for a while now, given the relative lack of films from the queen of exploitation, Meiko Kaji. In her relatively short career as the sovereign monarch of all things violent and sexual within Japanese cinema, we've already covered roughly half of the more important projects, namely the Stray Cat Rock series and Blind Woman's Curse. This isn't to say that Kaji stopped acting after her short stint as cult cinema's top dog, just that before long, she bowed out of the limelight and started taking smaller roles, as we already saw with Kinji Fukasaku's Battles Without Honor and Humanity series. But hey, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Come along today as we look into one of Kaji's two arguably largest series from this period in her career, Female Prisoner Scorpion. The Female Prisoner Scorpion series is something of an odd duck in the annals of Japanese film history. It's the textbook definition of something that could only come from the time period in which it was created. As such, the cliché that nothing else quite like it exists is in full effect here. The films are based on a manga series, which was par for the course during the early 1970s. They were produced in quick order following the success of the first. The subject matter is lurid to say the least, a group of female convicts in a dystopian prison complex rebelling against the guards and the government that put them there. The films are remarkably stylized in their violence, and the whole series is carried by a sole consistent character, our near-mute protagonist, the titular Scorpion. The films have remained a cult staple worldwide, dripping with 70s cool in their post-apocalyptic feeling vision of Japan that sits remarkably adjacent to the actual world of the 1970s. Some have gone so far as to call the quartet the definition of pinky violence tantalizing viewers with their sexual nature while offering satisfying violence in the form of a protracted revenge story. Whatever one's opinion on the films, it's hard to argue with their lasting influence. With how much staying power the movies have retained, we ought to look to Female Prisoner Scorpion to see what it can tell us about the film scene of the 1970s within Japan. Female Prisoner Scorpion's first iteration, Female Prisoner No. 701, Scorpion, saw release on August 25th, 1972, making it arguably one of the first major examples of a woman in prison film. This could explain right away why the film is so markedly different from its American and Italian counterparts in the genre, which wouldn't hit it big until the later 1970s and into the 1980s. Not present yet is the rampant nudity, save for the opening title sequence, with the camera instead focusing on the overblown violence between the women and the guards of the prison. The film, being the first for director Shunya Ito and one of Kaji's first top-build projects, was not expected by the studio to do particularly well, given how overscheduled and over-budget it went. However, upon release, Female Prisoner No. 701 struck a chord with Japanese audiences. Almost right away, it was bumped from the secondary slot in its screening to the headliner. What was it that people saw in Kaji's fierce Scorpion in 1972? As we previously mentioned, the film, and the series as a whole, used a manga series of the same name by Toru Shinohara as their jumping off point. Shinohara is known for his portrayals of undaunted, fierce women through his works, and Scorpion is no exception. Given the trend of the time to adapt manga and a gambit to attract a younger, larger audience, Toei bought the rights to this series of his, and began production on multiple movies, hoping to cash in on the trends of the time. Initially, the film was supposed to be more scintillating than it turned out. This information comes from reports that, at her audition, Meiko Kaji was informed that there would be nude scenes in the film. Angrily, she stormed out of the office. Only later did the filmmaker realize the importance of the passion Kaji displayed. A passion worth capturing on film, even if he had to do away with the excess nudity of the project. The first film deals with Kaji's character, Nami Matsushima, falling in love with a corrupt police officer. The officer screws her over and sets her up to be sexually assaulted by a group of gangsters. Angered at having been duped by this man not once, but twice, given that she also gave the cop her virginity, she seeks revenge. Failing to kill him, however, she is put in a woman's prison, where she is branded Prisoner 701. Multiple times, the corrupt cop and his Yakuza cohorts set up stings within the prison to try and do away with Nami, but each time she comes out victorious, clutching to her life and more emboldened than before. By the close of the film, her anger has turned to pure rage and hatred, 
and she participates in a prison riot in order to see through her one last gambit to take down the cop. As we said, female prisoner number 701 hit a nerve with the public. It toppled all expectations at the box office, and cemented the continuance of the series. Granted, Toei already had plans for the future with Kaji and Ito, but this early success meant that any future Scorpion films would receive more fanfare than the initial release of Part 1. As was typical of the time, the production schedule ramped up following even the smallest amount of success, meaning that before the year was out, Female Prisoner Scorpion Jailhouse 41 hit screens on December 30th, 1972. While there is an amount of continuity between all four parts of the series, we would argue that the greatest bond rests between this film and its predecessor. That is to say, while parts of 3 and 4 are definitely within the same timeline, they can likely be viewed without complete prior knowledge of the series and still be understood. Jailhouse 41, on the other hand, represents the truest form of a sequel, picking up more or less right where female prisoner number 701 left off. We join Nami, aka Scorpion, after she has been placed in solitary confinement due to her violent antisocial behavior. As luck would have it, the warden of the prison is up for a promotion, and an inspector is coming by to see all the facilities and inmates at the opening of the film's events. Scorpion, using a handcrafted shank, injures the warden in front of the inspector, once again inciting a riot and, hopefully, stopping his promotion. As retribution, the warden sends Scorpion alongside several other violent women to a labor camp. Along the way, however, they stage a breakout from their transport. The remainder of the film follows this band of misfits trapezing through the Japanese countryside, evading the prison guards and searching for civilization. Jailhouse 41 takes a remarkably bleaker tone than the first film, if only by virtue of it being a road movie. The cold greys of the prison are replaced by the wide open dirt fields through which the women travel, landscapes that might normally be used for idyllic photo opportunities to showcase the natural beauty of Japan, turn into areas of terror, where the women could be hunted from any side. Without cover, and with only one rifle between the group, this film becomes a more tense, and at times hallucinatory, viewing experience. Good things must come in threes, so it was only natural that the Scorpion gravy train kept rolling into 1973. On July 29th, the third film of the franchise, Female Prisoner Scorpion, Beast Stable, was released to theaters. Unfortunately, this would be the last collaboration within the series between Shunya Ito and Meiko Kaji. Fortunately, even after working together this many times, the duo found new ways to mix things up while keeping the narrative and characters in line with the rest of the films. This time around, the film is all about Meiko Kaji's hat. Okay, I'm totally kidding. This time, we follow Scorpion outside of prison, creating a whole new dynamic right off the bat. This works out for her until she runs afoul of a newly introduced ex-con who knew Scorpion in prison. Her Yakuza lackeys look for Scorpion while the police try and track her down as well. As such, we have the reckless violence of the guards from prior films filled in by the gangsters, while the cops present us with a cooler, more calculated approach to hunting Scorpion. Ultimately, Beast Stable fared well for the franchise, but Shunya Ito decided that he had had enough. Though he had won accolades for his works on the franchise, it seemed that Ito wanted to spread his wings and work on other projects. After all, Scorpion was all he had to his name as director at this point. That being said, the show had to go on, and Toei called in a director who, despite working for multiple production houses by this point, was a faithful purveyor of program pictures. You'll remember Yasuharo Hasebe as the director of three of the five Stray Cat Rock films meaning he and Kaji already had rapport stretching back several years. 701's Grudge Song, released December 29th, 1973, would be the final film in the franchise, and in some respects, it's understandable why. This time around, Hasebe used his signature style to tell the tale of Nami meeting the first man she can trust in all the time since the first corrupt cop. Like Nami, this gentleman has fallen in with a bad crowd, and the two hit it off. However, before long, things turn sour for the duo, and they end up becoming less friends and more enemies. Clearly there's a bad rabbit in this block, and it's got my pink clown enemies. All the while, the police are still hunting Scorpion, this time trying to strike at her newfound weak point by pursuing this man as well. Grudge Song suffers from some bizarre characterization choices that leave it feeling like it's totally removed from the other films save and name. 
This makes sense when you consider that the dynamic duo of the initial trilogy had been broken up, and that Kaji was the main, if not the only, bridge between the series at this point. Grudge Song is not a bad film per se, given that it has its own host of positives to mention. The visual style, the continuance of Kaji's ruthless violence, the more somber tone compared to the prior films, we simply mean to say that the disconnect within the franchise is notable here. Regardless of personal feelings about the individual films of the franchise, there's a good bit that the female Prisoner Scorpion films can teach us. Of course, there are the elements that we've gone over in detail, which you can learn more about from the episodes on screen right now. The penchant at the time for adapting manga, the advent of pinky violence, the production line style of filmmaking during the 1960s and 1970s. At the risk of repetition, we won't keep going over these elements here. Rather, let's look at why, amidst these various movements, Female Prisoner Scorpion achieved such a high level of notoriety, and why the films are still remembered fondly to this day. Visually, the films are masterful on a number of levels. The first three fit into their own category here, while Grudge Song stands alone given the differences in style between directors Shunya Ito and Yasuharu Hasebe. What unifies the two, however, is their usage of eye-catching, acid-laced visuals, especially during fight scenes or periods of exposition. Ito utilizes a visual metaphor for Nami's loss of virginity which draws to mind the Japanese flag, the flag that we see proudly displayed at the start of the whole series. The flag here shows the facade the prison and its guards are attempting to uphold in spite of the seedy happenings underneath this proud veneer. Similarly, Nami's virginity being lost to a corrupt cop and summoning up the same image may be intended to show the director's views on how women were treated at the time, as people to be used for personal gain on the part of men. The second film, Jailhouse 41, while being perhaps the most dystopian of the films, with visuals verging on post-apocalyptic, also contains the most hallucinatory sequence of the series. Here, we're shown the history of Nami and her fellow escapees by means of an elderly woman singing their life stories to the accompaniment of whacked out visuals detailing the events. Who is this woman? Why did they find her in the mountain? The film is unconcerned with questions like these instead favoring a visually interesting means of providing exposition rather than merely conveying it via dialogue. The third film is much the same in terms of stylization, though of course the setting confines the space of these bizarre set pieces. No longer are our protagonists wandering the wastes in search of their homes. Rather, Nami hunts alone amidst the crowded streets of metropolitan Japan. After everything that came before, this film almost feels mundane, until one realizes the implication that there could be a scorpion lurking in any alleyway or subway station. The final film is a notable departure from Ito's style, given that it's more muted in comparison. The world of Grudge Song, while still concerned with the dark, lamplit nightlife of Japan, is remarkably closer to what 1970s Japan actually looked like, rather than taking minor differences and making them utterly pronounced like Ito did. Hasebe instead embraces the more realistic darkness of the world in which he already lived. This likely dealt a blow to the continuity of the series as well, making the final film feel more like a hard-boiled revenge detective thriller rather than a post-apocalyptic exploitation extravaganza. The difference here makes sense when we consider the differing backgrounds between the two directors. Hasebe at this point had been directing for some time. He had broken away from Nikatsu and begun working for any studio who would hire him, given his reputation as a solid, reliable program director. We went more in-depth into his background in the Stray Cat Rock episode. We won't go too into it here, but suffice to say that besides being assistant director to Seiju and Suzuki at one point, Hasebe mostly worked out his own style on his own. Ito, on the other hand, was a bit of a different story, seeing as how he served as assistant director under Teruo Ishii prior to becoming a full-fledged director. We've looked at Ishii several times here, with horrors of malformed men and orgies of Edo just recently. Most important to our discussion today, though, was Blind Woman's Curse, which as it turns out, was one of Meiko Kaji's first big-name projects by which we know her. When you consider the bizarre, Edoguro-inspired visual style of Ishii that we've talked about in each of the previously mentioned cases, it's no wonder Ito's own flair would hit so close to home. Sure, Ito remained more grounded in these early directorial projects, not using deformed characters or buto dancers to set his films apart as Ishii did. Rather, Ito seems to have learned from Ishii how to effectively draw out the grotesque side of human violence and distill it into his own approach. 
The Scorpion films thus end up feeling less like the lineage of Edogawa Rampo and more like ultra-violent revenge thrillers. Ito doesn't concern himself with period dress and the nobility of a time gone by, but instead looks to the bleak future he may have foreseen. The films on display here are also remarkable in how they gave a voice to an audience which remained criminally underrepresented at the time, that of the empowered female. There's a reason why these films, alongside the two Lady Snowblood projects, hitting screens when they did meant so much for their legacy. That reason is also the same for why the films did as much for Kaji's later career and influence, something that we'll tackle as we close out the episode. Simply put, for the preceding decade, Yakuza films had been the bread and butter of certain studios, namely Toei. In fact, the previously mentioned major debut of Kaji's new persona was in Blind Woman's Curse, a Yakuza movie. Around this time, the early 70s, experimentation was rife throughout the industry. These old standards, the Yakuza film, the period film, the chivalry film, were beginning to pull in less revenue, and studios needed to adapt to stay afloat. Without this internal strife, it's questionable if Kaji's earlier successes in delinquent films like the Stray Cat Rock series would have even been successful, or possible. After several years of this experimentation with badass female roles though, Toei among others were willing to try slightly larger projects, chief among which was the debut of Scorpion. As we discussed earlier, the first film in the series wasn't even intended to do very well in theaters. Home video wasn't a factor yet in recouping production costs, and the studios seemed resigned to the fate of losing money on Female Prisoner No. 701. Ito had demanded that the film be shot in sequence, which resulted in the aforementioned four-month production. This, in and of itself, shows that either Toei was in too deep to stop and scrap the project, or that they saw some potential in what Ito and Kaji were doing. Either way, what seemed like a recipe for disaster actually turned out quite well. Something in Kaji's portrayal spoke to the film's audience. She was cool and calculating, intelligent and vicious, everything that a modern woman might want to be, and everything that a modern man might want in an assertive, self-confident woman. What may surprise some viewers is the realization that in the later films of the series, Nami almost never speaks. In at least one of the films, she literally has only one or two lines. Thus, she had to do a lot more legwork in terms of acting with her body and her expressions. That glower that she's known for to this day may not have been born on the set of Scorpion, but it was certainly perfected here. What we're getting at here is that Kaji's work on the Scorpion series spoke volumes about what audiences wanted to see and how they wanted to project themselves onto the films they watched, but also about Kaji's acting prowess. In short, she was the perfect actor for the role, and what she put together with Ito and Hasebe left a lasting impression of the empowered, scorned, embittered woman, which had not been put to screen so perfectly or exactly before. This also cemented Kaji's image as Scorpion, an image which remains borderline inseparable all of these years later. Like Marlon Brando as Don Corleone in The Godfather, or Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, Kaji was an actor with a bit of a career both behind and ahead of her, but Nami Matsushima became a part of her public persona. What's more, the films helped her career in terms of transitioning to stardom as well as tapering off from said stardom. Kaji had already begun her singing career working on the theme song for Blind Woman's Curse, but it was 701's Grudge Song, the series theme that really cemented her music career. Again, the theme for Lady Snowblood helped on this path as well, but we'll get there another day. Not long after Female Prisoner Scorpion, Kaji began taking minor or secondary roles in films once again, something we discussed with the Battles series. We can't speak for her, but it seems like she had done what she wanted in terms of being a leading lady, and that she instead wanted to pursue roles which were more challenging or which interested her more deeply. She continued acting and singing for a time before eventually disappearing from the scene almost entirely. Every now and again since the 1970s, Kaji has shown back up in either role, as an actor or a singer. What's more, just recently Kaji was named one of Vogue Japan's six women of the year for 2018. So we can say that even today, decades later, Kaji is still doing well for herself. We'll be honest, in terms of textual analysis, there's a wealth of things we could go into with Female Prisoner Scorpion, but in all honesty, we wanted to take this opportunity to switch things up a bit format-wise. 
Rather than delve into the potential themes of politics, feminism, misogyny, prison corruption, or anything else that might come to mind, we instead wanted to discuss how the female Prisoner Scorpion films came to be as they are, and the legacy they've maintained to this day. If you're interested more so in analyzing the films, we strongly encourage you to check out Tom Mess's book Unchained Melody, which explores the entirety of Kaji's acting and singing careers. The chapter on Scorpion goes more into just what Ito and Hasebe might have meant with some of their thematic inclusions. Additionally, we recommend the book as a whole, which is available from Arrow Books, as we heavily used it for research given the sheer amount of research that Tom Mess obviously put into this project. Check out Female Prisoner Scorpion, which has been preserved and transferred into high definition for American and British audiences in Arrow Video's beautifully crafted box set containing all four films and oodles of extra goodies. All of the films might not 100% hold up to the test of time, but they're all worth checking out at least from the perspective of film history. Some of them are fantastic, while others might be of lower quality, and of course, that's just our perspective. Our perspective is also that they're essential viewing for understanding the cultural zeitgeist of the 1970s within Japan, as they are for understanding the changing tides of cinema at the time. Let us know below what you think of the series, and which film is your favorite. Stay tuned on Cinema Nippon, where someday we'll get back to Miku Kaji's works and close out her career as a leading lady with a discussion of the Lady Snowblood films. For the time being, though, we hope that everyone has a fantastic holiday season, and we hope to see you around soon. Thank you.